It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, sponsored by Apex Atlanta and Talent Stream. Broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia, Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the companies, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. Now, here are your hosts. All right, good afternoon and welcome to Supply Chain Now Radio. Uh, we are broadcasting live today from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Scott Luton. I'm your host for today's session. Now, in today's live webinar, we're going to be focusing on continuous improvement and specifically organization in the workplace. We're going to be diving into both the psychology behind it and the returns it can produce. Our guest speaker today is Bo Groover, founder and president of the Effective Syndicate. So more about our good friend Bo Groover in just a moment. But as always, we are glad to have you uh, with us here today on Supply Chain Now Radio. All right, so we're going to tackle, uh, well, actually, we're going to jump right ahead to our sponsors. Uh, so let's let's recognize our sponsors here on Supply Chain Now Radio. Big thanks to our sponsor, Apex Atlanta, which has been serving the metro Atlanta community since 1964. Uh, Apex Atlanta is a nonprofit industry association dedicated to the supply chain management space. To learn more, visit us at apexatlanta.org. And TalentStream, special thanks to our sponsor, uh, TalentStream, a WeBank certified recruiting and staffing firm that specializes in helping organizations find top talent in the engineering, the manufacturing, and the supply chain space. To learn more, visit us at talentstreamstaffing.com. All right, now let's tackle our ground rules. All attendees will be on mute as we're looking to optimize the audio experience. Now, with that said, let's make it as interactive as possible. So please do submit your questions via the chat toolbar. We'll answer as many as we have time for at the conclusion of today's webinar. And finally, a PDF of today's presentation and the recording will be available in the next few days to each of our attendees. All right, so to our audience, you are in for a treat today. Let's introduce our featured speaker. Bo Groover has been working with manufacturing and operations focused organizations for over 20 years, primarily focused on developing bulletproof processes and teams that are built to win. Bo has helped organizations save millions of dollars while also improving those companies' customer experiences and building high performing teams that continue to drive the business forward. He has developed his approach and strategy over years of working with some of the biggest companies and most successful companies, where Bo has held multiple levels within these organizations. Some of these companies include the Coca Cola Company, Nordson Corporation, and West Rock, which was formerly, of course, Rock 10. Just prior to launching the Effective Syndicate in 2015, Bo served as the Director of Lean Supply Chain at Serta Simmons Betting, LLC. Academically, Bo has earned his MBA, his Six Sigma Master Black Belt, and he is Lean Certified from the Association of Manufacturing Excellence. Bo, has also, or Bo also currently serves as an Executive Advisory Board member with the Apex Atlanta Chapter. With all that said, please join me in welcoming Mr. Bo Groover. Thanks, Scott, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank all of you for uh, sharing this time with us. Uh, we hope that we can provide some value to you and uh, share some things with you that you can take with you. And this one's a little bit different than our normal webinar topics because it is certainly about uh, continuous improvement, but it also includes some uh, human psychology kind of aspects to it. So uh, this, is, this is a new one for us, and I'm excited to, uh, to jump right into it. So a quick look at the agenda. Um, obviously, welcome and thank you. Uh, we've all heard of workplace organization, and I think it's one of those words that uh, it's kind of like leadership or teamwork or collaboration. We talk a lot about it, but maybe we don't take a step back and say, what does it mean? So we're going to spend a, just a, a bit of time on that. What's the current state? And then uh, the, the point of the matter, what, why is it bad for business and why is it bad for your mental well-being? And then we will wrap up with, so what, uh, what can we do about it? And then a quick summary and recap, we'll do some questions and answers and then wrap up thoughts and upcoming opportunities. So uh, just briefly, why do we do these webinars? So 
obviously uh, this takes a, a little bit of production on our end and obviously a time commitment. So what we're trying to do is share the things that we've learned to help organizations and individuals who are striving to be awesome. Uh, number two, we want to help people get more pleasure and satisfaction from work. And I keep looking for a place that's written down that says work must suck and I can't find it. So I, I'm going to assume that it's just a bad, uh, bad advice. Uh, number three, we want to help people build their networks, uh, learning people to lear learning how to connect with people who are in their industry or their service space or other you know areas of interest. And then finally, we want to continue learning from the people um, who are willing to share their time with us and, and share their ideas and their learnings and experiences. So um, we're firm believers that if you want to lead, you got to learn how to learn. And so um, we're, we're trying to put ourselves out there and also learn from other folks who are uh, subject matter experts. So have you ever worked around someone whose desk looks something like this? Uh, my guess is we all have. And, I'm, uh, you know, if we were live face to face, I could see you nodding your head right now. But I'm assuming that you're nodding your heads. Um, and, and it just elicits a feeling of um, yuck, right? I mean, so I'm kind of a lean nerd. I'm kind of an organizational nerd. So this, this situation would absolutely make my skin crawl. Uh, it would make me feel anxious. It would make me feel antsy. And it would not be a place that I would want to spend much of my day. So we've all seen stuff like this. Or what about this? And I was, as I was finding this picture and looking at it, I was thinking about, you know, if I worked with this, co this coworker and I needed to ask this person for help on a project or something, I would really kind of check myself and say, all right, is this person already so overwhelmed? Are they going to be able to help me? Are they going to have time to help me? Um, or, or am I going to be, am I going to end up in one of those piles as a forgotten note, letter, email posted? And so I was thinking, you know, what does this picture say to you if you think about it? And then what would it say to a new employee? So let's say you're being interviewed at this company and you're doing the cursory tour through the building and looking around. What would you think if you saw this? And then what do you think it would say to your coworkers, right? So if, if this is your desk, not pointing fingers at you, but I'm absolutely pointing a finger at you, what are you telling your coworkers? And then what would it say to a potential customer? So let's say I'm thinking about doing business with your organization and I'm visiting to do our sales proposal or whatever. And I walk through and I see this, uh, it's probably not the best feeling in the world that, that you could take away with it or this. So now we're into a warehouse, we're into an operation. Uh, maybe this is a manufacturing place. Maybe this is a distribution center. But again, if, if you're walking through and you're looking at this, um, what level of confidence or lack of confidence is this going to create for you? And I would argue, um, I would probably keep looking. So if I were looking for someone to do business with, and this is what I found when I walked through their place, I think I would probably say, well, you know, thank you for your time. I appreciate you showing me around and we're going to, uh, evaluate and make our decisions later. So uh, what do we mean by workplace organization? Um, I think we've all, you know, kind of got an idea. So I, I looked this up on a uh, website that I visit quite often, leanmanufacturingonline.com. Uh, I have no affiliation with that. So that was not a plug that was just telling you the source. And they say workplace organization is focused on the reorganization and visual management of the equipment, materials, parts, information, and people to allow anyone entering the work area to determine its status at a glance. And so if you take that and you think about that as the kind of foundation, um, I would add that it's ensuring that everything that is in that area should be in that area. Uh, something didn't just get randomly dropped off and uh, left behind or forgotten. And also ensuring that what is needed is close to where it's used. So that's what we mean when we're talking about an, an organized workplace, right? So I've, I've got what I need and it's located close to where it's used. And if someone walks into my area, they should be able to, within a reasonable glance, understand what's happening and, and the current condition. So if you think back to those warehouse pictures or those office pictures, at a glance, what I see is chaos. 
what I see is disorganization. What I see is someone who I'm going to be pretty reluctant to engage with on any meaningful project because I'm skeptical that he or she's going to deliver anything back to me. So the, the title says the psychology and the business case uh, for workplace organization. So what's this about the psychology? Well, it's been an interesting uh, learning. I've been spending some time over the last year doing some digging and research on it. But have you ever got a song stuck in your head? Those of you who are parents, how about Let It Go from Disney's Frozen? How about your welcome from Moana? Uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson singing the lyrics. For us Gen Xers, uh, Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi or Don't Stop Believing by Journey. And Gen Y, I, I picked a couple, uh, Umbrella by Rihanna and Oops, I Did It Again by Britney Spears. So these songs, if you just hear a snippet, they seem to be like earworms. They crawl into your head and you can't get the chorus out of your head. And maybe you, this isn't one of your songs, but hopefully you're familiar with what I'm talking about. So it gets started and you just can't get rid of it. So that's an example. Or at your home or at your office, maybe it's a burnt out light bulb. Maybe it's a squeaky floor. Maybe it's a doorknob that's coming loose. Maybe it's a, um, a crack on the counter, whatever those things are that you see. And then you notice them and you say, man, I need to, I need to replace that light bulb. Or I got to figure out how to get this floor to stop squeaking. And then you go on about your day and it kind of falls off of your radar. So you think, and here's a hard one. Anybody ever been through a really hard breakup and you spend some time replaying? Should I have said this? Should I have done that? Should I not have said this? Why did they say that? Why did they do that? Why didn't, why couldn't they understand? And so you keep making these laps and your brain is just spinning around this thing, right? So this is a very, um, in the forefront of your mind kind of situation. This is one that you, you recognize what you're doing with it. It may not be like the burnt light bulb that you see and then you kind of pass on, but there's three examples, right? So the, the song lyrics that get stuck and then you notice something maybe that needs to be done or repaired or fixed. And then this very front of your mind, one where you went through something hard emotionally and you keep making laps around it. You keep replaying. So why is this? It's called the Zegernick effect. And if you haven't um, encountered this, this is actual uh, psychology. And I pulled this off of Wikipedia, but I've read enough about it to know that this is a, a pretty decent explanation. But what they learned was our brain has an ability to remember something that is incomplete, right? And, and that's a really good thing, mostly because it triggers us to say, Hey, uh, you know, I've got to make sure I don't forget that. It could be, I've got to make sure I, I've got that meeting with Scott in my planner. I've got to, he talked to me on the phone, but I was driving. So when I get home, I got to remember it. So my brain keeps bringing that thing back up. And so that sounds really, really great. And the way they studied this was, um, they started with a waiter. And if they asked the waiter about a table that was still open, meaning the people were still eating and still ordering drinks or food or dessert or whatever that the waiter could articulate. Well, they had this for, uh, you know, a, a starter. They had this to drink. They had this for a main course. They could remember these things, but once the bill was completed and they had transacted the money, they asked the waiter, you know, what did those people have? They had a tough time remembering. Like, I don't, I don't know. I think they had the fish. Oh, maybe it was the chicken. So they got lost. <clears throat> so this prompted, um, Bluma Zegernick and her, um, I guess, professor, mentor, whatever, Kurt Lewin to start digging into it. And what they figured out is that this process creates a task specific tension. That's their words, which it, it creates this accessibility in your mind. So you know that there's something that needs to be done. So it's very task specific, but because it's unfinished, our brain flags it and says, all right, I've got to remember this. I got to make sure that I keep up with it which sounds great, right? It allows us to not forget things that are uh, important or not to forget things that we need to follow up on. However, uh, there's also a pretty ugly side to it. So why is the Zegernick effect bad? 
So if you look on the left, you see mind, body, and spirit. And uh, I try consciously to work on all three of those things. I try to do things to exercise my mind. I try to do extra uh, things to exercise my body. And then I try to do things to exercise my spirit. So that's kind of my core, right? But then I add in life. So I've got mind, body, spirit, and then I've got some activity with the kids. I've got to take them to school. I got to pick up their books. I got to go buy them a new batting helmet for baseball practice. So they take up a chunk and, and today's garbage day. So I've got to remember to take the garbage out. And then what are we going to have for dinner? I got to figure out where to, where, are we going to go out to dinner? Where am I going to go cook? Do I need to buy something? And then, oh, my, my car's making a funny noise. Right. And so I'm completely made up these percentages. So don't get hung on the percentages, but recognize that my brain has a limited bandwidth. And the more things that are on my brain, the less I'm able to focus on my task at hand. So if I'm at work working on a big project or maybe I'm trying to write a proposal for a client and I've got all of these other things kind of bouncing around, it makes it harder and harder because I have a limited bandwidth in my in my brain capacity. So let's add the rest of life, right? So I've got mind, body, spirit. Now I've got kids, garbage day, dinner, car repair. Where's that report? I think I left it here on my desk. I'm, I'm pretty sure I had it right here under this folder. Oh yeah. I got to remember to get light bulbs and don't forget to get stamps. And I need to pick up milk on the way home. And mom called me last night, uh, but it was over dinner. So I've got to call my mom back. And then where's that broom? I got to clean up this office and, and we're out of staples and I, I need to replace the toner and man, I'm tired. I'm just tired. So psychologists suggest that we have between 60 and 70,000 thoughts every day. That's a staggering number, right? So you think about your brain out there just running all the time and it's producing 60 or 70,000 thoughts every day. So <clears throat> how do you keep all of that stuff going and how do you keep yourself from being so distracted? Well, I will argue that it's about getting organized and staying organized, which is the pitch. So what's a body to do about work anyway? And I'm going to say, organize that workplace, baby. Let's get going. So I'm hopeful that all of you by now have heard of 5S. Uh, it started in manufacturing. It, uh, it is credited with the movement of uh, the Toyota production system. Although I think um, organizing manufacturing workplaces has been around for a long, long time. So let's go with whatever it is. The five S's were originally Japanese, which is why I think Toyota gets credit for it. But these five S's translated uh, roughly mean sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. So what do, what do we mean by sort? Well, let's get rid of what's not needed from the work area. Um, I will challenge all of you to open up your desk drawers if you're in the office or your workspace if you're in manufacturing, whether that's a workbench or a desk, and look at the stuff that's accumulated over time. Maybe you've got three boxes of staples. You probably don't need three boxes of staples. Maybe you've got, you know, a collection of pens or magic markers or highlighters. Pick your thing. And so what does that do? Well, that creates clutter. And so that's pretty easy to, to rifle through. But if you think about an operation where I've got manufacturing happening or logistics and warehousing or common spaces in the office, now I've got a population of people that are interacting with this area. And some people may use the printer a lot and other people may use the paper cutter a lot, right? It kind of depends on the role and the task. So if you don't, have it organized, you are bleeding time as people are looking for tools and equipment. And that's really the theory behind 5S. Um, I believe very, very strongly in 5S. In fact, I was once asked if I could only have one lean tool in my toolbox, what would it be? And my answer was 5S. So we're going to sort, uh, we're going to separate what is needed from what is not needed. Let's get it out of the area. Uh, number two, set in order. Let's straighten out what is left there. So the things that we are going to, in fact, use are, are neat and orderly. Number three is to make it clean and shiny. And some people like cleaning. Some people hate cleaning. But uh, it should be clean enough to um, you know almost eat from. So if it's a tool, it ought to be spotless. If it's a work surface, it ought to be very clean or replaced, right? So, again, if I'm working in crappy conditions, 
and I've got my table leg propped up on a brick and my chair is missing a wheel. That's the kind of work that I'm going to do because I'm distracted by the fact I'm balancing my work chair and <laughs> missing a wheel. Um, <clears throat> number four, standardize it. So mark it out so that anybody could walk in and see where something goes. Uh, people laugh at folks like me because I want to basically outline and label everything. Uh, when we first started, we decided to have a lot of fun with it. So we were labeling doorknobs and we were labeling put your butt here in chairs and light switch because we wanted people to like break through their, well, do I need to label this? Do I not leave? So we labeled everything. We labeled carpet. Uh, and then the last one is sustain. So what is the process going to uh, need or, or what is the process you're going to use to ensure that once you get it organized, it stays that way? Right. So all of this, it, it sounds really simple. I will tell you it is a ton of work, but when you get there and you realize how efficient you are, when you reach for the stapler and it's there, when you go to the common area and you need paper for the printer, the, the paper's there, or, you know, you, you need the pair of pliers and the pliers are where they're supposed to be. You realize how much more efficient you are and it allows your brain to stay on task. So let's say uh, I need to print a, a report. So my brain's on the report. I think I've got it ready to print. I hit print and I go. And I know that once it's printed, I may edit it, take it back to my desk, edit it, get it ready. But on the way to the printer, I figure out that oh, the paper, the printer needs paper or the printer needs toner cartridge. So now I get distracted. And I start looking for toner cartridge. Well, I run into Scott. Hey, Scott, man, you seen the toner cartridge? Do you watch the football game? Yeah, me too. Where are you going for lunch? Oh, man, I haven't tried this. So now I'm losing time. I've interrupted Scott's work day, but he's my friend, so we don't mind. But it just causes this very subtle kind of chaos, and it costs you a lot more time than you realize. So then you get back on task, and you find the paper, and you load the paper, and you print your report. Now I've got to get back. I've seen studies that say it takes as long as nine minutes from a simple interruption to get back on task of what you were doing. So that's the that's the psychological and business case for why workplace organization is so important. So <clears throat> we're going to start with a, a plant that um, we, we started doing some lean work in a long time ago. And this were the power, pile of tools on the workbench. This is what it looked like. And so the first step was what is actually needed at this workstation. And it went from this pile to this pile. And I, I will tell you that some of the things in this pile that's on the screen right now uh, weren't present when we started. So we got rid of some stuff and then we found some stuff that should have been there that was missing. And then we tried to organize it, right? So this is uh, set in order. It was shined and this was our standardization process uh, where everything was labeled in a home position, right? And then the evolution of it, uh, this is what the benches eventually ended up looking like. And there were multiple versions of this bench. So this bench, if I, if I came in today and this was my bench, it looked just like the bench that was right behind it that I worked on yesterday. At a glance, if you look, you can see on the right side of that pegboard, there's a wrench missing. So if you have no idea, you've never been in that workspace before, you could walk up at a glance and say, ah, where's that wrench? Right. And the same is true of the stapler, of the tape machine, of the broom, of the pliers, of the ink toner, of the whatever. This is the idea of at a glance, I can see what's what's happening there. And I also want to note that this is very much an iterative process. Right. So you don't set it and forget it kind of thing. It is you set it, you work through it, you figure out what's working, what needs to be changed, and then you do it again and then you work through it and then you do it again. So. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. And this is, you know, workplace organization is certainly uh, within within that area. <clears throat> so uh, pictures speak a thousand words and I've been speaking a lot of words, but here's here's a thousand words for you. This is a before and after picture of obviously the one on the left is the before and the one on the right is the after. <laughs> Scott just said his is on the left and mine is on the right. I, I doubt that, but. I get what he's saying. Uh, another one. Uh, and this is a, a, a Kaizen that we did actually to reduce inventory. So look at the inventory that is piled up on the left and the inventory that is piled up on the right. 
And I will tell you that those are tiny little parts, but they were highly technical and very precise machined parts. So there are tens of thousands of dollars on the left and not nearly as many on the right. Some work we did in Canada. Um, those are our French words. And no, I do not speak French and I do not know what those words mean. Uh, visually, I think I can get an idea, but there's something special going on there. If you look at the picture that's on the left and the bottom right, not only are things neat and organized and labeled, but they've also prevented it from getting cluttered. So there's only room for that bucket. I can't put the bucket and, and stuff some brushes in there and stuff, you know, some cleaning bottles. It doesn't go there. So that is a, a, a kind of an advanced way of thinking about 5S. But, Bo, I don't work in a warehouse or manufacturing. Well, I understand that. These principles are very much the same, so I wanted to include some office pictures. So on the bottom left, um, this is in a, a manufacturing plant, and we have frequent visitors to our manufacturing plant. So we have the, the guest Wi-Fi, right, that they can sign on. They can also map to these printers. So those little signs behind those printers would have the printer name the path directory and a quick set of instructions of how to map to each printer as well as the capabilities. So obviously the tiny little guy on the left was a fax machine. The one in the center I think was a black and white and the one on the right was a high speed color machine. So depending on what our visitor needed to do, they didn't have to come in and interrupt somebody and say, Hey Scott, can you print this for me? Let me email you this file, interrupt your work. You pull it up, print it for me. Right? So, that's kind of the idea. Again, we're trying to be efficient and be effective and, and not uh, cause unnecessary interruption. On the right, again, there's labels and there's home positions. So I can see that the paper cutting machine is supposed to go right there. It's got a square around it and there's even a visual management work instruction, right? So again, I've never been in that area, but I could walk up and I could plug into this office pretty easily and start working, which is kind of the, the idea. Um, before and after on the left, uh, doesn't look bad, right? I mean, it's, it's neat, but I don't know what's supposed to be there. And what's not supposed to be there on the right. Everything is labeled out. It's called a business center. Um, you know, I walk up, there's a tape machine. There's or a tape dispenser. Excuse me. There's a stapler, there's scissors, there's paper clips and there's paper. So, uh, hopefully this is pretty self-explanatory and, and you're kind of seeing how this would work. Now, as a new employee, if I walk in and, and I say, Hey Scott, you know, I, I need a, I need a paper. Where do, where do I get paper? Scott just says, this is a business center right over there. It's labeled. So once I see this, I can see all this stuff is here and, and what's supposed to be there. So I can know, Oh, next time I need something, I know to come here or, you know, to go somewhere else. If you'll also notice I mentioned we went over the top to the right. You'll see the garbage can is labeled with garbage can. It's got an outline and on the floor. It says garbage can. <clears throat> and then we go to extreme lean, which is funny, right? You never have to even get up and go to the bathroom, but look at the person's desk. It is not clean and orderly. It's MacGyver's, MacGyver's desk. That could be MacGyver's desk. I think I, I don't know where that desk is, but I don't want to visit that office any more than I want to visit the first office. <laughs> All right. Uh, so hopefully um, we, we've painted a picture, right? So we know that it's more efficient uh, at work from a work perspective to be neat and organized. Hopefully explaining the way our brains work a little bit from the psychology perspective will help you recognize that you are basically sucking out your brain's capacity with the more things that you allow to pile up, right? So here's the punchline. Very simply stated, your brain needs closure. If we go back to the, to the painful breakup, right? The reason that you keep reviewing those, those feelings and those conversations and the what ifs and the coulda, woulda, shoulda things is because your brain is unwilling to accept that it's over because you, you never got closure and your brain needs something final, right? So, um, as much as I hate to say it, death is a finality. Right. So if someone passes away, you can say, I love them. I miss them. I wish they were still around. But at the end of the day, it is final. And, and so your brain starts moving through the denial, uh, anger, 
bargaining acceptance uh, process of dealing with stress. When someone's not uh, deceased, they're still there. I could still call them. They could still call me. We can still talk about it. Are we sure this should be over? So that's kind of the thinking behind it is, is your brain is looking for closure. Now let's be a more, a little more lighthearted. And when let it go comes on, or you hear a clip it and you can't get out of your mind, it is still because your brain is looking for closure. So if you want to get closure, find that song on YouTube or on Apple music or whatever you use, play it till the end and it'll be gone. Because what has happened is your brain is registered. I really like that song. I really like that chorus. So let me finish it. Well, I don't know the words. So now I just sing the chorus over and over and over. Right. Or I'm, I'm hanging out with my friends and I just like to say, let it go when they keep nagging about something. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, part two, our brains are marvelously designed not to forget things that need to be completed. The items that are left undone are consuming some part of your brain. And the more of them there are, the more brain powers being consumed or distracted. It's just like internet bandwidth. When I'm streaming a video and, and my son is streaming a video, the internet is slower, right? So the more things that you get streaming out there that says, don't forget the light bulb, don't forget the stamps. You got to pick up milk. What are you going to do for dinner? Those things are all siphoning out your ability to focus and stay on task. So uh, what do you do? I recommend that you get organized as quickly as possible. And the little things that end up on your to-do list that, that should just be done, right? Just knock them out and get them done. Don't even bother writing them down, right? So you see it, you respond, you correct it, and you move on. Now, if you don't have time to get them done, at least write them down. The act of writing, and, and I keep notebooks on hand constantly, is that your body or your brain recognizes I have transferred this task to another keeping device. Okay. Uh, I prefer handwriting. I think that is a stronger connection to my brain because there's a physical component, but typing a list is okay. Doing a voice memo is okay. Do something. So you recognize the light bulb is burnt and you need to replace it. Write it down somewhere. If you can't get to it right then that's, that's kind of the point. So with that, I think we're going to turn it over to questions and answers. And if you've got some, please uh, drop them into the chat. All right. So good stuff with both thought, thought provoking for sure. Uh, and so if you're in the audience right now, this is your lucky day. You're going to have the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes with a, um, a world-class consultant and business leader, and he's not going to send you an invoice. So <laughs> pose your questions. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts of our webinars with Bo is, is we're going to be posing some questions to him and, and uh, helping folks out there that are fighting through their own continuous improvement um, challenges. So first question, Bo, comes from Thomas. And Thomas asks, what's the hardest part about workplace organization? Good question. And thank you, Thomas. Thanks for being here. And thanks for the question. Um, so I think there's two hardest parts. One is deciding to do it because it will be a lot of work. And the second, um, maybe more obvious one is how to sustain it. So in our more advanced, uh, manufacturing principles, we use something called a layered audit. And what that means is we're auditing the same process or the same area with multiple perspectives looking at it. So it might be twice a day. The folks who work in the area are going to check three things. And then once a week, a supervisor may check 10 things. And then once a month, the department manager may check 25 things. And then once a quarter, the plant manager may check 50 things. And so this layered audit keeps eyeballs on it all the time. Now, all of those audits are subsets of the other ones, but the daily audit may be wipe off the table, sweep this space and ensure you replenish the stock, right? So the, the consistency of everybody looking at it and it's drawn from having a standard Right. So if I walk up and I've got everything labeled and organized, I can look at a glance and say, all right, are all of my tools present? Yes. OK, that's my audit where when you don't, you can look and say, well, everything looks kind of neat and orderly, but I don't know if I have the right screwdrivers here. I don't know if the pliers were returned. I don't know if the wrenches are here. So that's the, the purpose of of the layered audits. And that is the best way to sustaining. But recognize going into it, sustaining is the hardest part. Hmm. Great question, Thomas. Next question comes from June Bo. Uh, June asks, what are you seeing 
from your clients and potential clients lately? Good question. Um, thanks, June, and and uh, thanks for participating with us today. Uh, I think I keep hearing our clients and folks that we're talking to describing they want to get better, right? So, Bo, we'd like to talk to you about Lean Six Sigma because we want to get better, and and we 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 drill into that because I don't like hunting with a shotgun. I want to hunt with a rifle, and I want to have one shot, one kill. So, what does getting better mean? And what I keep finding and running into is, is when you ask them that question, um, they can't really articulate it. We were, we were working on a proposal and we said, Hey, list these in priority. Is, is it, is it safety improvement? Is it cost reduction? Is it delivery improvement? Is it morale improvement? And they replied, all of the above are equally important, which to a guy like me says, well, if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. And that's probably what your problem is. So let's talk about your culture and your leadership. Not pointing fingers, not pointing blame, but if, if you tell me you've got 10 things that are all equally important, I'm going to tell you that you're probably not performing very well. So what I'm seeing mostly, um, or at least recently, is just a lack of clarity of what is it that we're trying to do? What what does winning look like? What is our Super Bowl right here in this this particular business? Great question, June. Uh, next question comes from Janine, and Janine asks, um, Bo, how do you address the individual who takes the approach, quote, I have always done it this way. It works just fine. Great question. That is a great question, and and I'm going to poke a little bit of fun, uh, Janine, at whoever says this to you. We, we have a group of people that we call cave dwellers, <laughs> and and cave stands for citizens against virtually everything. So um, I don't know if this person happens to be a cave dweller, but it's just a good uh, kind of mnemonic device. Um, the way I approach that is, you know, are we talking about her space or are we talking about a communal space? So if it's a shared workspace, then her little argument probably won't um, hold water because while she may understand how it works, the rest of the people may not be getting the same level of agreement. So it's a team question. If it's her space uh, individually, then perhaps she might need some coaching on the culture and the expectations. Um, you know, I, I've worked with people whose desks look like a bomb went off, but they're wanting their people to have standard work and their workplaces to be organized. And I'm going, how do you reconcile that? Your desk looks like crap, but you want my desk to look great. I don't, I don't understand. So, um, the, the, the position that the person holds, uh, the situation that it's in and, and what is the area um, that you're talking about. And by Janine's uh, chat response, I think she agrees wholeheartedly with you on the, on the cave. So that's C A V E, uh, citizens against virtually everything. That's right. Doesn't matter what you bring up. Their first answer is going to be no. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, so to our audience, uh, we've got about, uh, 12, about 1240. So we're going to take the next few minutes here to continue taking questions. This is your opportunity to use the chat toolbar and pose your questions to both. Yeah. And Janine, if, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn and we can message back and forth, I'm happy to try to help you come up with a strategy. Um, I will tell you that, that there are people who choose to never get on the bus and then it becomes a leadership question. So are we really trying to build a culture and to have discipline to that culture? Or is it just somebody read a book about workplace organization and now they're trying to drive it? So lots of things to discuss there on, on that particular situation. Happy mm -hmm. to help if I can. And there's probably folks like that in every organization, whether you're in their most modern day progressive you know, organization that delivers in two hours or if you're in organizations that have been around for 100 years, right? Could be. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Jim Rohn. So Jim Rohn is a world class, a world class speaker and you can find him on YouTube. He's one of my favorites. But he talks about when he first started out, his mentor said, now, Jim. There's only nine or 10 really nasty, mean, ugly people in the world. <laughs> only nine or 10 of them that you're going to have to deal with. So just take that in mind. There's only nine or 10 of them. They move around a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Jim Rohn, S-R-O-H-N, -S right? That's, that, like, that's correct. His last name. He's, he's got a lot, of, a lot of deep books out there. Um, so I want to pose a question to you, but I've got, I've got two questions here. Uh, first and and we did not prep on either one of these questions. So, uh, if we want to table it, we'll table it, but you know, um, there's so many organizations that use outside assistance to drive continuous improvement and projects and, 
and uh, operational excellence, you name it, whatever you want to call it, lean, whatever. Um, how would you counsel? Or is there, as you're, um, if there might be folks on this call here that, that are considering uh, outside of resources, what are one, two, three things to, that you would um, suggest to these folks to keep in mind when they're making their decision with using outside help? Uh, good, good question. Un unprompted question. So I, I appreciate you, um, testing me out here. <laughs> so, um, I, I think if you're, if you're thinking about using some outside help, obviously I'm a big advocate. So I left corporate America so that I could go do this kind of work. Um, and it is my, my passion and I love doing it. So, um, a couple of things that I would encourage you as you're looking at who you want to work with, um, number one is, do they have a prepackaged sale? Like, so if you go buy cookie dough at the, at the grocery store, it is a prepackaged cookie mix. They've got the right chocolate chips. They've got that, but it is, it's done. Whereas if you go buy the flour and the eggs and the chocolate chips and the milk, you can play with it. Or maybe you want to add peanuts or maybe you want to add peanut butter chips. So are they bringing you something that is kind of a canned approach to continuous improvement? Or is it something where they're going to sit down with you and, and spend time saying, what are you trying to do? Uh, I will tell you that that a couple of the contracts that we've won recently was was based on that. Um, our competition brought them something and said, "Here's how we do this," and we brought them something and said, "How you know what are you trying to work on? What are you trying to improve?" And and we'll, let's see if we can help you. Uh, More we, tailored approach, exactly. Okay. And and we had one one client that they posed it in a way that we said, "Look, we're not the right fit for you." You know, and we referred someone else to go chase after that account because we would not have helped them as much as somebody else could have because it wasn't our sweet spot. Um, I think the second thing is um, if you're going to hire somebody and bring them in, listen to them. OK, so external resources uh, like myself, I've worked with probably 35, maybe 40 different organizations by now. And I bring in a wide breadth of knowledge where a lot of these clients that I'm working with, there's people that have been there for 25 years. So they know one environment, they know one culture, they know one leadership team. So if you hire somebody and say, Hey, Bo, what should we do? And I say, well, you know, here's what I see. Let's talk through options A, B, and C. And we say, I'm going to ignore all A, B, and C. I want to do D. I'm looking at him like, why are you paying me to be here then? That's, you know what I mean? So if you bring somebody in, listen to what they're saying or, or don't bring them in because it, it, if you bring them in and ignore them, you're both going to be frustrated. Hmm. Appreciate that perspective, Bo. Um, so one other question you mentioned, and, and I like how you put it, it's not a plug. It's a resource you use regularly. Uh, if we do anything, if we like doing anything, we love to give resources to our audience. Uh, so lean MFG online.com is what you referred to earlier. What do you use that site for? Just, just reference. So, uh, that, that's one of them. Um, on the, on the six Sigma side, there's one called, uh, I like the letter I six Sigma. And I don't remember if that's .com or .org, but if, if I need a, a simple definition, right, maybe I'm, I'm trying to prepare for a presentation. I have obviously, you know, bunches and bunches of PowerPoints, but sometimes it's easy to, um, get a different perspective or somebody's already spent time getting a summarized definition of what I'm trying to articulate. So, um, those, those resources, and there's, there's a bunch of them, right? It, it's like YouTube. I can look up probably 10,000 leadership videos on YouTube, um, at, at the, at the touch of a finger. So th that's the, usually what it is, Scott, it's a quick reference point just to make sure I'm articulating it in a way that resonates. Perfect. Uh, and Malcolm and the uh, Supply Chain Now Radio research team just uh, handed me a note. It is i6sigma.com. So it sounds like that's another low cost or free resource. Uh, and we all can't we all can't uh, can't get enough of those. So lean mfg and i6sigma.com. Fantastic. All right. So uh, and John, appreciate your comments there. Uh, and, and for our audience, John mentions uh, great, timely, useful information. And he'll be following Bo on LinkedIn. Appreciate that, John. Thanks, John. Uh, all right. So, Bo, we talked about um, going back to a universal concept, this new employee, and you know, setting them up successfully, whether they're in a manufacturing environment or a distribution environment or an office environment. Talk more about that because, you know, attracting talent and then keeping that talent. You know, I've read somewhere that they'll know 
uh, if they're going to be there long term or not in the first two weeks or, or some ridiculous amount of time. So speak more about what you've seen uh, companies really do to, to, to make them feel welcome from the first hour. Perfect. Uh, great, great topic. And, and maybe Scott, that's one of our next webinars. I love that topic. Um, so I, I will tell you personally, uh, which matches what I've seen, uh, kind of generically. So I started with an organization and day one, I showed up and my boss was there to greet me when I got to the, to the, uh, office. He had my laptop. He had my cards printed. He had my cell phone. He had my American Express travel card, uh, all packaged up in a briefcase. And he spent the majority of the day with me. He took me around to the departments that I would be working with and the people that I would be supporting. When I left there that day, I was, I was literally on cloud nine. I was like, holy crap, what an amazing organization. And I'm still in touch with him because I, he's one of the leaders that I follow and said, you know, this guy's got it. I want to, I want to continue to be like this guy. When I left that company, um, under lots of circumstances, the next company that I went to, um, I showed up and the receptionist wasn't expecting me. My boss who traveled was not there. He hadn't designated someone for me to connect with. Mm -hmm. So I literally spent an hour and a half, my first day sitting in the lobby, um, looking on my phone at LinkedIn or, or Facebook or whatever I was doing. Um, it took nine days before I got my laptop. Mm. It took me 12 days before I could sign in to my laptop. So I was literally <laughs> bringing my own computer back and forth to work uh, and literally trying to find something to do. Um, and I knew it wasn't two weeks. It was about four hours that I was not going to be long term at that organization. Mm -hmm. and, and consequently, I left. So generically speaking, if you take that out, when your people show up on day one, you ought to escort them and plug them in and show them around and take them to lunch and introduce them to people and just say, I am so here for you. What do you need? What do you like? What do you need from a boss? Let me tell you what I like for an employee. Here's the culture that we've got. Here's what winning means. Articulate those things in a way so they can go home and talk to their spouse and say, man, sweetheart, I joined this great company. Here's what we're trying to do. And here's our vision, mission, and values. And here's the culture that they follow. And my new boss spent the whole day they will walk out of there on day one feeling like, man, they hung the moon. They have mm. hit the jackpot or <laughs> you show up and, and you can't get in the building and you don't know who to talk to. And they say, well, I think you're supposed to be talking to Joe. So hold on. You sit here and let me go find Joe. And an hour and a half later, I come back. Hey, I found Joe. He doesn't know who you are either. So, <laughs> <laughs> strike so, two. <laughs> strike two. Yeah. You're going to be over three. I'm going to leave. I'm going to quit before lunch on day one. <laughs> Um, so either, you know, get really, really organized and, and together or recognize that you're setting your people up to come in and say, this place stinks. Mm. That's a great perspective. And, and we will, you know, um, there are so many different ways that continuous improvement could apply to talent acquisition and development and retention. So we'll take you up on that and we'll do our, one of our next webinars, uh, on that topic. So, um, that's going to wrap up Q and a today. A right. big thanks. To, I've, I've got one. Yeah. For you, Mr. Scott. Oh, sure. <laughs> so um, Scott and I have known each other Flipping for script about 13 years, I think. I was trying to remember exactly when we met, but it's been a long time. So we've been collaborating together for a long, long time. But before we started, did I hear you say you've done, you've gotten almost 4 million downloads? <laughs> wow, man. Uh, yes, very humbly. Uh, I'll confirm that since May Let's see here. May 2017 is when we first started podcasting. We've been in webinars for five or six years. And uh, thanks to a bunch of great guests and 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 hosts and a and, um, bunch of great partners and supporters, we have had over 4 million uh, downloads, uh, all told between podcasts and webinars. So, yeah, it's pretty neat. Fantastic, man. Congratulations. Done, well, well, again, it's, it's about <laughs> the content and about the folks we feature. And I think we've done at least if you look at events and podcasts and webinars, we're probably Baker's dozen at this point. I think I, I would guess that's probably so, right. Um, so one last comment before we, we move on out of QA, we had a late breaking comment from Mr. Steve Rudnicki. Hey, Steve, good to see you again. Uh, great to see you down in Orlando. And Steve mentions that, uh, that conversation mirrors. And I think going back to the, um, what we we're talking about talent, uh, attraction or retention, that conversation that Bill was talking about mirrors getting young folks, on the chapter board as well. So Steve is a, a longtime Apex volunteer. Mm. Um, as, as, as most of y'all may know that 
volunteer your time with industry associations. It is tough. If we think it's tough getting folks uh, hired in our quote unquote day jobs, you know, try to get volunteers and especially those that actually do some heavy lifting. It's very challenging. So Steve does a lot of great work with, um, uh, well, he's an adjunct professor, I think, at, at, at one of the local colleges, uh, but he also engages that that early generation that may have just gotten out of college and nice. moved into the supply chain industry. And, you know, that's, that's such a wealth of knowledge for groups like APIX and ASCM and, and others to tap into, get them engaged and, and get them leading. Going back to something you said earlier. Yep, get them leading. That's awesome. So, uh, and speaking, you had a great quote there. And sorry for the false wrap-ups of Q&A a couple times, audience, but uh, it keeps – uh, bring me back to some things you, sh you shared, Bo, you mentioned, if you want to lead, you must learn how to learn, right? Yep. So Absolutely. It, speak to that a little bit more. Yeah. So, um, I think it was Stephen Covey in seven habits, right? It said sharpen the ax or sharpen the saw. I don't uh, remember yeah. what you used. So, um, I've been doing lean six Sigma for 20 years and I love it. And I consider myself pretty well versed. I, I, I won't go so far as to say a subject matter expert, but I just, I don't, there's still so much for me to learn, but my routine is I will look up leadership stuff on YouTube. I will watch it. I listen to Jim Rohn and Les Miles to talk about personal leadership. Uh, I listen to Les Miles, the LSU football. No, different Les no, Miles, different <laughs> Les Miles, uh, the incomparable. Uh, Les Miles. I got you. Okay. Um, <laughs> But I listen to books on Audible, right? So I, I travel quite a bit. So, um, you know, there, there's got to be a way. I, I like to read, uh, but I, I think, you know, that that's a challenge for me because by the time I'm finishing reading emails and reading uh, responses and reading proposals and reading, 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 it's hard to sit there and focus on words when you've had a, a long day, as, as some of you guys may can relate. So uh, Audible, YouTube. Um, webinars like this, right? I, so I listen to a lot of your stuff, Scott, mm. and, and, and I keep picking up things. So if you want to continue growing and learning, y y or, excuse me, growing and leading, you've got to keep learning because the, the pace of industry right now is just breathtaking and mm. you will get left quickly. Great point. Great point. Uh, always got to learn something uh, every hour these days because things are changing so fast. So that is going to conclude our Q&A session. If you can't tell, we really enjoy the Q&A. It's one of my favorite parts of, of each of these webinars. Uh, big thanks to all of our participants and your questions. And, of course, Bo, uh, Bo thank you for your time and perspective today. If you want to learn more about Bo, uh, Bo Groover and his firm, you can check him out at theeffectivesyndicate.com. And, of course, you uh, want to follow him on LinkedIn because they share a lot of great content, blog posts, you name it. Um, so we're going to be concluding our session today on just a few final items. So first off, Supply Chain Radio has, uh, well, I guess not recently anymore, but we've rolled out a text to subscribe feature for our webinar programming. So rather than, than registering for each webinar as we roll it out, you can send uh, text the word supply chain to 42828. We'll take it from there. We'll make your life easier. We'll get you auto enrolled in our webinar programming. Of course, you can always opt out of that. Uh, but hopefully that's um, it'll save you a little time week in and week out. Next up, we want to make sure you're aware of the I for Transport's 3PL and Supply Chain Summit here in Atlanta, the Supply Chain City, in June 2019. Uh, EFT is bringing some of the biggest industry names right here to Atlanta for three days of thought leadership and executive level networking. Supply Chain Radio is very pleased to be serving as a media partner. Uh, you're going to find Cisco, Uber Freight, Land Lakes, DHL Supply Chain, you name it. Just a few of the companies that will be presenting at this conference. You can learn more at events.eft.com or you can check out the hyperlink that will be on the deck uh, that will take you to the site and you can check it out for yourself in case you want to join us. Lastly, uh, you know, check out our website for upcoming webinars, podcasts, and events. That is supplychainradio.com. Be sure if you if if you well, I'm not going to take if you I'm not going to say if you take anything away from this webinar because Bo gave us a great <laughs> Thanks, great information. But we'll be sure to uh, mark your calendars for the 2019 Atlanta Supply Chain Awards sponsorships and registrations for the awards luncheon are still available. Uh, the winners have been determined by our esteemed judging panel and they will be uh, announced at this March 12th event. So check it out at atlantasupplychainawards.com, a nice, simple, and sweet URL. And if there's anything on any of these topics, if there's anything we can do for you, you can shoot us a note uh, to scott, S-C-O-T-T, at supplychainnowradio.com. We will make sure to connect you with the resource you're looking for, if we can. So, Bo, yes. before we conclude today's session, any final thoughts on your end? 
Yeah. So I'm hoping that uh, you guys will, will take away from this, that uh, you, your brain is being distracted, whether you know it or not. And I know a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm good at compartmentalizing. I'm good at segregating that stuff. I, I'm sure that you are. But I will tell you that psychology says that there's a part of your brain that is being preoccupied by your to-do list or your undone list. So I hope that you'll take away and, and kind of look around at your desk and your work environment and your home environment and say, all right, what, what kind of clutter am I living in and what is that doing to my performance? So I hope that's a good takeaway for everybody and I hope everybody has an awesome weekend. Absolutely. That's a great way to, to wrap up the show on here. Um, so as we wrap up today, we'd like to give a big thanks again to our guest, Bo Groover with the Effective Syndicate. Big thanks to our sponsors, Apex Atlanta and Talent Stream. Of course, a big thank you to our audience for participating. On behalf of Supply Chain Now Radio, this is Scott Luton concluding, uh, concluding today's episode. We hope to reconnect with you again real soon. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody.